And we are back. It is JC and Morgan again, presented by Chicken Cock Whis- Whiskey, as well as Site Pro Rentals and Nest and Wild Mattress. He is JC Sherbert in Chicago. Mike Morgan here in Studio South, down in South Florida, and uh, somewhere I don't know. Andy's been all over the place. I know he was just in Tuscaloosa recently, interviewing Kalen DeBoer. Uh, Andy, where are you? I'm at home. You're at home, back in Gainesville. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I finally. Got home and uh, was in Knoxville last week and Tuscaloosa last week. And very interesting. Two programs that are uh, very, very excited about things. Uh, the, the reports of Alabama's demise are uh, quite premature, I assure you. they uh, I think they're feeling pretty good about things. Yeah, well, I know you're feeling pretty good about things. We were showering you with praise at the top. We, we've we uh, been busy with a lot of people kind of uh, in your space uh, that cover – college football nationally and we've had a number of guests each and every week and like we haven't had andy on in a couple of years i think that's when i am am the competition you know on three is the competition so i understand it's it's a it Ah, it happens it's competition in some levels for me but it's not i mean i like this i used to i've lived that i've lived that i've lived where you're living uh, a couple times so i don't i don't know you know i don't know if it's coming there's but nothing yeah, to love on this side of the table it's like the bobs yeah. in office space yeah it's like Bob's. exactly it's like is it you say you do here <laughs> well i worry people <laughs> that's it's it's debatable uh, that's uh that's debatable no we were talking it's been a couple of years since we've had you on and i at the time that was still kind of like the remnants of covid was still going on and i thought oh yeah you handled that about as well as uh as can be expected amongst the national guys i think i even called you the paul rudd of college football <laughs> national uh, guys and that nobody has a bad word to say about andy staples you're not polarizing you just do your job you give an opinion when when necessary but for the most part you love college football and you you want to bring it to the people. Am I am I right in the saying that? Can I still call you the Paul Rudd of, of the I, Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Look at us. Yeah. But uh <laughs> you know, I think I I express some fairly strong opinions and that does make people mad sometimes. But then I'll I'll I, I don't really care. Like it I, I always enjoy the the Andy hates your team thing. Like, I don't hate your team, I love your team. Except when I don't, and I will tell you that. And right. if that's a problem, don't worry. Come back in six months. I'll probably say something bad about your rival and you'll love me. So exactly. exactly. It, all, it all works out. Uh, so we were talking for those that don't know, because you have obviously are working for a different employer the last time we've had you on. Why don't we start with this? Tell everybody what you're doing and who you're mm-hmm. doing it for. So I'm at on three now. I, I, I was at the athletic before that. I was at Sports Illustrated. Uh, but now I'm at on three and I do a show every day, 8 a.m. Eastern time on the on three YouTube channel. Uh, so we have Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. Eastern time. And then it's obviously on demand anytime after that. And you know, if we have a good interview, like we had Kalen DeBoer on the show hmm. on Monday, uh, we're, we're going to split that off. You can just watch that on demand if you want to. Uh, and I would highly recommend watching that if you are interested in what happens post Nick Saban in Alabama, because he if you didn't get to know Kalen DeBoer while he was at Washington last year, then maybe you don't understand kind of the level of success he's had throughout his career. I don't know that there's going to be a ton of drop off. And I, I realize for most people elsewhere in the SEC, it's like, oh, crap, come on. We we were hoping that Nick Saban leaves and suddenly this is not what what it was. I think it's going to be kind of close to what it was. And so but yeah, I'm, I'm doing essentially a lot of the same job I was doing before. Uh, we're, I had a a podcast at the athletic, we've expanded the hell out of that. And Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a daily show now. And we have a ton of fun on that show. And like, you know, we, we, we hit almost all the college sports. We've talked a lot of, of NCAA tournament here in the last few weeks, this morning's show, we spent half the show on Iowa LSU last night. I mean, that, that was a hell of a game. So I just, whatever, whatever people are interested in, we've got it. We, we also, on today's show, I had Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl on, and, and he and I just sort of imagined DJ Burns, the NC State post player, as a uh, as an offensive tackle, and then spent the time like we talked about some of the basketball guys that have transitioned into the NFL, but also like just some of the ones we wished had tried football, like just just maybe try it, and like my 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 one that that I always felt like is the one that got away and. 
he clearly made the right decision because he's still in the NBA right now. But if you go back and look at Jay Crowder, who's, who plays for the Bucks now, when he played at Marquette, dude's from Villarica, Georgia. Like, should have been an SEC tight end, should be an NFL tight end right now. But he's the sixth or seventh guy on the Milwaukee Bucks. I don't know exactly what he makes. He's probably like $22 million a year guaranteed. So I think at he least. probably made the right choice. Yeah, yeah. I, I there, there's a few players like that when like when I'm doing college basketball, like LSU has a a, a guard that used to play at South Carolina, a, a point guard who's like six feet, and he he looks like an outside linebacker, just built like a brick, you know what house. And I do the same thing. I find myself yeah. seeing a certain college basketball athlete, and I'm like, golly, he would be a hellraiser on the football. Well, field. I, I, when I was at SI, we you know I would cover the NCAA tournament in person every year. And I had VCU one year and Mo Ali Cox was playing for VCU. And we act like we got around his locker, like, dude, why don't you play football? And sure enough, <laughs> he plays for the Colts now. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're out there for sure. Um, let's go, let's go back to the Kalen DeBoer thing for a moment because, and, and uh, you know, you probably vote on like 20 of these things. I only vote on two things every year. Uh, the Heisman trophy, which I've voted mm -hmm. for like the last 16, 17 years and the Home Depot coach of the year. And my vote was Kalen DeBoer. And so I, I, and that forced me to do more of a deep dive on his background and just like how good he's been everywhere he's been. So I, I'm totally with you on uh, the hire. I don't believe this whole thing. If, if Alabama didn't learn anything from Mike DeBose and Mike Schu like the whole, I've got to fire, hire an Alabama guy. No, you don't. Um, Nick Saban had no ties to Alabama whatsoever, and he's the GOAT and obviously uh, worked out pretty well. The Kalen DeBoer hire makes all the sense in the world. And you obviously came away with that interview uh, impressed with everything that he brings, the energy, the intangibles, and the track record speaks for itself. But all that being said, I mean, you have to like look at it and say, fairly or unfairly, Every time this guy, first off with an expanded playoff, Alabama doesn't make a playoff. It's going to be just the sky is falling. Yeah. If they're not playing for national titles by like what year three, he is going to face the most brutal scrutiny of anybody in college football. Oh, yeah. so, I mean, they, they how does he be, react to that? He's he's fine with it. He understands that's what it is. He, I mean, he's got to be playing for national titles in year one. He understands that. What's what's so interesting is. It's a smaller scale, but his first head coaching job was exactly the same situation. So the, the, the only difference was he was the internal hire there. So he, for those who don't know, Caleb DeBoer grew up in South Dakota. He went to the University of Sioux Falls. He was a receiver. He helped them win a national title in the NAIA in 1996. He starts coaching right after his career ends. He was their OC from 2000 to 04, and they were really good. So... Bob Young was the name of the head coach. They were 47 and five in Bob Young's last four years mm -hmm. as the head coach. So he steps down. Kalen DeBoer takes over. So he's taking over a program that has been 47 and five over the previous four years. So clearly there's a lot of like, it's not Alabama. There's not millions of people watching, but there's tons of pressure because you're taking over a program where all they do is win. So what does he do? Well, he loses two games that first year. They make it to the NAIA semifinals. That's that's just not good enough, Kalen. Well, the next three years, he goes he goes fifty six and one and wins three national titles. Or so the next bad. four years, four years, fifty six and one, three national titles. Like he he's lost twelve games as a head coach. He's one hundred four and twelve. Three of those losses are in the COVID year as Fresno State's coach. So I don't know if we can even count those. He went nine and three in his first full year as Fresno State's coach. And so I, that, that's what you're talking about. This is a guy who's won everywhere. And so I, I would be genuinely concerned if I'm the rest of the SEC about maybe Alabama not dropping off very much at all, even though it's not Nick Saban. Let me ask you something, Andy. A&M and Bama – open this year and it sounds weird even saying that but th those are two schools obviously with unlimited resources mm -hmm. and unlike maybe some coaching searches in the past at some other schools around the league it looked like this time they both went for the best ball coach they could find 
Who's a well, winner? Well, no, A&M, A&M went for from. Mark Stoops first. They, yeah, but he, they had he's a revolt a coach, you know. He, uh, he yeah, is, he, he but wins. He, he wins, but not against teams with winning records in the SEC play. That's, that, that's, that's, that's a very the problem. Good point. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting because Mike Elko, kind of a similar profile to Mark Stoops, where longtime great defensive coordinator and then successful as a head coach. The, the difference, I think, with Elko is that there's not the body of work. I think the body of work with Mark Stoops says – he recruits really well above his, his station, and he also develops really well. But he tends to not let his OC have a lot of fun. And Elko so far, and it's only a two-year sample size, but it seems like he's willing to, to let his, his OC cook a little bit. And yeah. you know, Kevin Johns at, at Duke, we'll see what happens with Colin Klein at Texas A&M. Uh, but no, I, I'm with you there. There was none of this. We got to find somebody from in the family. I think, and I think people have kind of figured that out. Like, I think you watched USC post Pete Carroll, and it was always trying to recreate that magic with somebody who'd been on his staff. And then they realized, you know what? That's that's not how it works. That's not the best way to do it. Now, weirdly enough, one of those guys, Steve Sarkeesian, seems to have kind of figured it out at Texas, but it took took some some doing. But yeah, I think I think. The idea of you have to have a guy who has a tie to the school, who worked there before, or who played there, I, it you got to understand how it how it feels to these people. It's a job. It's like your job. There are going to be days where it's great, days where it's terrible, but they're all they're going to look at it like you would look at your job. Like, is this a good place for my family? Is it, it's not going to be like I have all this nostalgia from when I went there. Like that doesn't matter. There's only a few Steve Spurrier stories. And look, Steve Spurrier happened to get to Florida when it was ripe to to take off. But Steve Spurrier also was the best coach South Carolina ever had and the best coach Duke ever had because he's a great coach. Like, it wouldn't have mattered. If he'd have gone somewhere other than Florida, he still would have done that. So that's the part people don't, don't understand. Like, it's just a job for these guys. Yeah, like Roy Williams in basketball going back to North Carolina. I mean, you know, yeah. that was he obviously has an affinity for the school, but he also won how many games at Kansas, you know? And, right, and, and exactly. Roy Williams was going to win yeah. anywhere. Yeah, so. exactly, exactly. So that's, I, I just found it interesting that, 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 you know, they didn't really hire recruiters either. I mean, these guys are evaluators more so than like they're known like a – like a hot shot recruiter, you know, like a Dabo Swing well, type guy. Well, I, I don't know about that. It like it, it kind of depends on your job, and, and I think Elko's been in sure. places where you had to be an excellent recruiter. But remember how Elko came up. You know, he was working with Dave Clawson. He was at they were they were at Hofstra and Bowling. Right? Well, actually, I think he was at Richmond with Clawson, but Richmond and Bowling Green and uh, Wake Forest, where you don't have it. You, you're not going to land any five stars. But if you look at Elko at Notre Dame as and Texas A&M. A&M's DC, yeah. he was a very effective recruiter. Sure. Um, and DeBoer, I think you've seen it since they got there. Like Ryan Williams, the first guy they signed as a, as a February signee. Ryan Williams is a receiver everybody in the world wanted. So yeah. it's, not, it's not like they didn't know how to do this. They, they might not have been at places where you could even – they, get in the door they, with these. Guys. They weren't known for it. I, they, they definitely yeah. were good recruiters. But, but my question with all that is: Is it more important now with the portal and all this movement to make sure that you do have your coaching, on field coaching, development, the actual art of coaching on game day, and all that tightened up? Because you're gonna you're gonna transition most a lot of your roster regardless each and every year. Is that more important now? than having a guy that may be like a, you know, just a, a rah-rah dude that can go land a bunch of players, but, you know, doesn't hire the right people, can't coach his way out of paperback. I was having this discussion with somebody yesterday about assistant coaches because we were talking about, you know, those guys that are known and and a lot of time, like D-line coaches especially. There's a lot of D-line coaches out there that are viewed as kind of Pied Piper recruiter types. I don't know that that matters anymore in the age of the portal in NIL. The NIL can take care of a lot of the recruiting stuff. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be the the best salesman anymore because your collective can can give you the thing to sell. 
that that doesn't require any sort of special salesmanship. And then the the portal is what makes better coaching a requirement. Like the schematic piece of it and the development piece of it so much more important now because the portal has eliminated the possibility of stacking so many good players that you can't make you can cover up your mistakes. Like you have to you have to utilize your roster to the best of your ability to the to its maximum potential or you're going to lose players because they will find the place where they fit and can play. Like the portal has made that way more efficient. And that's tough if you're Alabama, if you're Georgia, if you're Ohio State, where you were used to having depth that no one else could match, where if you had a couple of injuries, it didn't matter, where if another team had a couple of injuries, they were screwed. Like look at Georgia last year in the SEC championship game at receiver. They, they were so thin in terms of healthy receivers, I mean, it killed him in that game. And that was the deepest team in America. So if they can have a game where somebody can get them because there's a position group that they're not as deep as they could be, so, I mean, everybody's got that. Everybody's got to deal with that now. And I think that's what makes it more interesting. But you're, that to your point, if you don't, show these guys how you're going to utilize them and also how you can put them in position to be high NFL draft picks. They're gone. They're going somewhere else where they can get that. And it's definitely evening things out. Now I like in terms of the depth piece of it, I think an interesting team to watch this year is Florida state. So Florida state had been really good at picking out of the portal. They've also done better at recruiting out of high school, but look at the portal guys they got this year. Lots of dudes who were not playing at Alabama and Georgia who probably would have been competing for spots this spring at Alabama and Georgia but would not have been guaranteed anything. That hurts Alabama and Georgia. And if those guys are as good as as FSU thinks they are, well, it might make them a playoff team. We're talking with Andy Staples here on JC and Morgan – Let's let's kind of use that as a jumping off point because you you obviously are optimistic about what Kalen DeBoer is going to do at Alabama after speaking to him and kind of putting them under the microscope. There's no reason to believe George is going anywhere soon uh, under Kirby with the way they've been able to just stockpile uh, recruiting classes. And and again, he's a great coach with a, with a good staff, even when they lose guys on the staff. So you mentioned you were in Knoxville. Um this becomes the every year question for me, and I want your thoughts on it. I, I've said many times, and I got a chance to repeat it again in Atlanta in December, we're living in the, in the SEC. We're living in an Alabama-Georgia world. Every now mm-hmm. and then, someone spikes like an LSU, but for the most part, we're still living with all the changes in, in college athletics, with NIL, with the portal, and now with the GOAT retiring, we're living in an Alabama-Georgia world. So. Who is the next team that takes that jump? Is it Tennessee? Is it A&M? Is it LSU? What is Tier 2 going to look like? And when does Tier 2 start to bleed into Tier 1 and maybe add something to Mike, an otherwise 1-2 punch? You forgot the team that beat Alabama and Tuscaloosa last year and made the playoff. The They're newbies. also in the SEC now. Texas. So I, You tell me, do you think Texas is on that level? Did they not prove that last year? Well, they, they, they mean, beat, yes, they, they were beat better them one than Alabama game. when they played. Uh, yeah, ab- ab- so. absolutely. But like, this is uh, this is the ultimate litmus test. This is what makes Texas so fascinating, right? It's like now they've got to play an eight game SEC slate, and mm-hmm. and now it's like, okay, can they actually get to Atlanta in the in the SEC championship? You game? don't have to get to Atlanta. Well, you're, you're right. They can still get a twelve team playoff and eventually fourteen. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, going to open I, doors I think, to Ole Miss and Tennessee. Georgia and Texas are the ones. And actually, Georgia and Texas, if you go by Vegas, have the higher win totals this year. Yeah, that's true. They're the they're the ten and a halfs. They're the right. ones that that are that are the favorites to to win the conference. Um, but Tennessee and Ole Miss have the schedules for sure, because that's something that everybody needs to be aware of in this new era of divisionless play whether it's the SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC did it last year, uh, and then obviously the, the Big 12 
you had the round robin. Now they don't. So now schedule draw matters in the Big 12 as well. And that's something we have to look at going into every season is who got the draw. Now, granted, what we think of the preseason might not come true in the in the season. Some teams might be better. Some teams might be worse. But if we just look at it right now, the path for Ole Miss and the path for Tennessee seem a little bit easier than the path for Alabama, the path for Georgia, the path for you know, LSU, Oklahoma. I think Texas's schedule is not not certainly not easy. And so that's the that's the other piece of this. Tennessee is an interesting one because I do th- if they can split Oklahoma at Oklahoma and Alabama. I'm I'm saying they probably don't win in Athens. Or they you know, I that that's that one I'm not not real confident in. So, so they probably don't win in Athens. But if you're 10 and 2, you're making the playoff. Mm-hmm. Like and Tennessee's capable of that. And they got a tricky one against NC State early. But deepest D-line we've seen at Tennessee in a long time. Receiver group seems replenished. It's really it comes down to Nico. Like how much better is Nico than Joe Milton? And I, su- I suspect Nico's going to be a lot better than Joe Milton. I would hope so, well, yeah. Look at, the, look at his wheels. I mean, look how – I mean, Milton – Hooker could run. Milton uh, – Nico could run. Milton could run. He just didn't want to. Yeah, it was – It was. I, I was I was never really sold on, on Milton. And I think, you know, I think Hooker, though, had a historically accurate year. But Nico's a different animal altogether. I like him a yeah, lot. Yeah, and, think, and, and, and that's the key is how, how fast does he develop – you know, what can they do with him in that offense? I, I think it'll be a lot more diverse offense than you saw with Joe. I think a lot of the, the RPO stuff had to go out the window. A lot of the, the read option stuff had to go out the window. And obviously that read option is a piece of the RPO. But I think Tennessee's going to be able to do a lot more, which will require a lot more prep for you if you're trying to defend them. And so I, I think they'll be pretty good. But again, like, when they go to Norman, how good is Oklahoma? I think we're we're writing off Oklahoma, which seems weird to me, because they don't typically have bad years. Now, the, the first year under Venables was not great. But last year they were a 10-win team. They beat mm-hmm. Texas. Like th- this, there's no reason to believe Oklahoma doesn't come into the SEC as a very good program and a, a program that you've got to watch out for. Well, Okay, so in in bracket terms, we just gave a lot of chalk, right? We just talked the the Mm -hmm. tops of the top, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, uh, Tennessee. We threw a little Ole Miss in there. How about a surprise team? How about a team maybe that's projected middle of the pack that you think could actually make some waves this year? I just – I don't know if there's any surprises because there's so many – like think about the, the expectations that Missouri are absurdly high. Yeah, it's true. I think Missouri's got a, a nine and a half win total. And it's like, wait, wait, dude, did you see what they lost on defense? Like, cause and the it, SEC's leading rusher, they lost him too. Yes. Yes. And so you, you look at all that, like LSU would be the one, but I wonder about LSU. Like the defense has to get a lot better. The defense at LSU was as bad as it can possibly be. And the offense was as good as it can possibly be. You have to suspect when you lose Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, that the offense takes a step back. So how much does the defense take a step forward to make them competitive? And, and remember, they won double-digit games last year. Like, as bad as that defense was, they still won double-digit games. So I don't know that there's necessarily a potential surprise team because would you be surprised if LSU's good? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. No, but, no, never, never. Because they've always got great athletes. The, but the questions they got to answer, Mike, to get to that are pretty daunting. Like, it's it's not going to be easy to get there. But, like, yeah, like you said, they've always got great athletes. And so, you know, does Missouri take a step back or do they continue to be good? Because if you if you have that, then I'm not sure where the room is for the surprise. You know, right? like, does Arkansas shock some people with Taylor Green coming in, with Bobby Petrino calling plays? Or is it, you know, this is it for Sam? The the one I think that has the capability because they have they have the athletes to do it is A and M. A and M I think would be the one that would be capable of shocking people. I I am surprised when I hear people talk about their own team's schedule and they've got A and M on it. And they're like, oh, that's a win. Like, are you sure about that? Are you sure? 
because they got a bunch of dudes and they're going to be better coached now. Keep Connor healthy at quarterback. Exactly. Like, I, I don't know that a lot of people remember what, I mean, even with Jimbo and Bobby Petrino, which was not the best marriage in the world, when Connor Wigman was healthy, that offense actually looked pretty good. So you put that with Colin Klein. I, I do think there's a chance that AM could be the one you don't want to play where you're like, oh, we were counting this as a win, and now we are very unsure about this thing. And without the cloud of all the Jimbo noise, and I mean that, right. that became almost an untenable situation. Um, you mentioned Arkansas. I, I got to ask you about two programs that nobody is predicting great things for. Last time I saw you was at the Steve Spurrier First Year Awards in in Gainesville, and I ran into Steve the night before, and I told this story at dinner, and I was with Shane Matthews, and he says, "Yep, guys, you know." Uh, you know what Billy would have to do to get to where we were 12 years in Gainesville? He'd have to go 81 and four over the next 85 games to match uh, <laughs> our record during the 12 years in Gainesville. I was just like, that is Steve being Steve. Uh, I say all that to point out that the expectation level is still high in Gainesville, although they've been kind of off the radar for a while. And yeah, at Arkansas, I mean, every time I'm in Fayetteville, they talk like, you know, they should be competing for much greater stakes. I don't know if Sam Pittman makes it to the end of the year. Um, so when you look at those two situations, obviously birds of a different feather, but just your assessment of what to expect with those two programs this year and, and what is the fix? What is the remedy? Well, Arkansas, I don't know that there's a fix in terms of competing for national titles or anything. Like, cause they, that's what they want, but Competing against the teams you have to recruit against is—is is that ever going to happen? Probably, probably not. That's just—it's—it's mm -hmm. it's, it's too hard when when, especially now that you've got Texas and Oklahoma in the league that are, right. are recruiting the same areas that you've historically recruited. You know that's that's where you've got a lot of your better players from. So, I just I don't know. I, the the Bobby Petrino hire strikes me as a oh here's our way to get Bobby Petrino back in the head coach's chair. If they fire Sam Pittman midseason, which because Bobby Petrino is the last guy to win there, and mm -hmm. they had to fire him because he, he obviously lied to his AD, put the put the university at risk in terms of legal liability, and so that is a it's just weird. And I like Sam Pittman; I think he's a good coach. I think it's a tough situation, and the expectations are probably a little little out of whack, but. They will make a change if they're as bad as they were last year. Like they will make a change. Now, you mentioned Florida. Arkansas did come to the swamp last year, and Arkansas won. That's a bad sign for Billy Napier. That, that was the game, I think, that if Billy Napier had folks in the fan base that were still holding on and, and hoping things would turn around, that's where I think they realized, ah, maybe, maybe this is kind of what it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't see anything that happened in the offseason transfer portal, you know, roster building that changes anybody's interpretation of them. Yes, they signed DJ Lagway and LJ McCray, but like DJ Lagway isn't supposed to be the starting quarterback this year. Graham Mertz is. And, and Graham was actually one of the, the pleasant surprises of last year. I thought he played really well, but you lose Trevor Etienne, you lose Prince Liam and Miel into the portal. I don't think they're a net better more talented team than they were last year and the schedule's harder. So I'm not sure exactly what they're supposed to do to, to get over the hump. Clean up pre-snap penalties would be a start, right? As a that former offensive one, lineman, you know, play, play 11 players on your field goal. Yeah. Point block team. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one too. It's but, a good one too. You know, I not, not, a, not important enough to have a, a, an on-field special teams coach. They're going to, they're going to stick with the analyst on that one. Yeah, uh, got to ask you a couple big, uh, big picture ones before we we go. I, I know uh, you were certainly covering like like so many uh, of us what was going on with the with the playoff and and what was going to be the number and what was going to be the TV deal and is it going to be twelve? Oh wait a minute, it's fourteen. Okay, when does it turn to sixteen? Just your overall takeaway of everything that's gone down here recently and really the last thirty sixty days. It's it's wild because. You think after they spent four years designing this, well, it was actually more than four years, it was five years designing the 12 team playoff, that they'd actually play it once to see if they liked it before they changed it. Hmm. So 
because it sounds like they want to do 14, which 14 is a weird number to me. And I think if, if we're trying to figure out why you would do 14 instead of 16, which is 16 is the same number of rounds. It's just no buys. The reason you would do 14 is the Big Ten and the SEC want their championship games to, right. to be meaningful. They want them to be for that buy. Because I, I think that's that's the big concern among all of the conference commissioners right now as they expand the playoff is we've got these cash cow championship games. They're either going to be irrelevant or they're actually going to be actively screwing the team that loses the championship. You heard Kirby Smart talk about that the other day. Like The team that loses the SEC or the Big Ten championship game is getting – totally screwed in the new format. So they've got to figure out how do they balance that because they don't want to give up the money they're making from that. But logistically, it might not be the best way to do it because right now, yeah, if you win the, if you win that game, it's great. You get the buy, all that, you know, all that stuff, you get the highest seed. But if you lose, the team that finished third in the league probably has it better than you do. What excites you most about I, I already know you've always been a free market nil guy what excites you most about the future of college football with all the changes that have come down the pike uh and what concerns you the most for example on the concern part of it there there's if these super conferences keep building up and we mm -hmm. have a true afc nfc world it's going to be awfully chilly if you're not invited to either one of those parties yeah that's the that's the hardest part and i heard you guys talking about that before i came on like how many teams is it and we did a, a fictional 48 team one a few weeks ago and that sucked like trying to decide who was who who you would have in it and who you would have getting left out mm -hmm. it was awful especially if you, we're assuming it coalesces around the sec and the big 10 and i know everybody like everybody every week asks me well, would they kick out Vanderbilt and Indiana? No, they're not kicking out Vanderbilt and Indiana. That's not going to happen. So you need to you get to get them to ask you to join their club. Mm -hmm. So in an ideal world, it, the number is in the 60s. You you have a pretty broad swath of of schools because I think the variety is one of the things that makes college football so much fun. In reality, I don't know if that's what happens, and I don't know how it happens because a lot of it depends on the business model. A lot of it depends on, do you break off football from, from the NCAA or do, do you have your own you know, management organization managing football? Because then that helps determine what it ultimately looks like. And my guess is fewer schools will want to share the bulk of the money. So it's probably going to be closer to the, to the 48, but you know, we don't yet know how they're going to get there. You know, a lot of it depends on settling this house versus the NCAA case, which is a, a big case that was brought by former athletes saying, hey, you know, we would have gotten a bunch of NIL money had you guys not been uh, breaking the, the Sherman Act. And so, like, the NCAA is going to lose that case. They, they're going to have to settle before it goes to trial because they're going to get destroyed if, if it goes to trial. And so the schools will end up having to pay a lot of that settlement. I think part of that settlement will be them creating a new business model. And they, they've just got to figure out how they want to do that. So I don't think we're that far away from it either. That's the part that's interesting because like, I've, I've been very outspoken about the SEC schedule that with the current alignment, they need to go to nine games mm -hmm. because if you stay at eight and you only have one fixed opponent, then you have Texas and Texas A&M in the same conference and they're not playing football every year, which is the stupidest business decision you could possibly make. But I'm not worried about that now because it, my thought is if they stay at 16, they're going to go to nine games for 2026. That's why they flipped the, the 24 and 25 schedules. But in reality, if we're, it, it, the, the chances of them being a 16-team league in 2026, I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. There may be more expansion realignment before then. And then the 8-9 discussion changes because the scheduling format changes. You might go back to divisions. Who knows? Like anybody who thinks they know exactly how this is going to go over the next two years is lying to you because even the Greg Sankey's of the world and the Tony Petiti's of the world who will be in control of how it goes. There's still things that are outside their control that are going to affect it. Like in the court system with the national labor relations, all that stuff that they, they're going to have to react to. And so they don't know what it's going to look like either. 
Two quick hitters on the way out. 2027 crystal ball. And again, as you mentioned, we don't know. It's we're 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 trying to project things that we don't have the answers to, and the people in charge don't have the answers to. 2027, Florida State, Clemson, where are they? What oh, conference? It's such a good question. I don't think they're in the ACC, but I don't know. Like, I'll put it this way. If I were a Fox executive, if I were a Fox executive and I looked at what the Big Ten has in terms of schedule, I say that looks pretty good when you add Oregon and Washington and USC and UCLA into the schedule. But then when I see the SEC release its new schedules with Texas and Oklahoma, I'm like, no, no, no. The SEC still got a way better football product than us. We have to make our football product better. And that's where even if Florida State and Clemson would not have been the schools that your Big Ten presidents would have chosen typically, like think about if you sprinkle the spear and the tiger paw through those Big Ten schedules, suddenly those look pretty awesome, like mm -hmm. from a television standpoint. Right. That's what I would do. Now, if I were the leaders of the SEC and I thought the Big Ten was going to encroach upon my footprint and take two brands that would give them some really good Southern football, I'd go, you know what? Nope. That belongs with our product. I would defend my borders. Yeah. And I it's think like a game of risk at that point. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. Because it, it, it's one of those things that if the Big Ten doesn't want them, they're in a pretty precarious situation. But my guess is economics will carry the day. They provide tons of value to a Big Ten football schedule. But there's also a lot of value for the SEC in keeping them away from the Big Ten. So that's where you, that's where you get the, the tug of war which I think would be really interesting. And then like, if you're them, let's say you actually had the choice. Let's say that there's a scenario where they have a choice. Which one would you pick? I, I mean, I, I think the fans of Florida state Clemson undoubtedly would want the sec. That doesn't right. mean the sec. Right. The administrators would probably state look Clemson. at it like, well, it's easier to win in the big 10. Oh, sure. But from a cultural standpoint, of course, it's the perfect fit in the SEC. Like Clemson right. is an SEC school. Florida State should have joined the SEC in 1990. Like it should they have been. Chance. Bobby Bowden yeah, said no. Uh, South Carolina, the, the beneficiary of Florida State saying no. That's, I mean, and you could look at it two ways. Maybe they don't have the national championships they do if they went to the SEC with more competition. But oh, right, I, well, I think they, they would have. Because. Because the Eventually SEC in, in, the, in the early 90s was not what it is now. Like That's true. Think, Great point. I think the, the Florida State, Florida, and Tennessee, like if Florida State had joined in the early 90s, the, the clashes between Florida State, Florida, and Tennessee yeah. would be spectacular. But I think Florida State still would have won a couple national titles. I think so, too. I think they would have broke through on uh, a couple. For, with all the talent that, that they were amassing at that point, it would have been hard not to. Uh, last one, your other passion, and a lot of people tuning in today. It's going to be their first trip this year to either Norman or Austin. They've never been there. And they want to know where to eat. And they want to uh -huh. know what to get. Yep. And even though you're now a svelte Andy Staples, much lighter oh, than your – Old playing weight. I know you still know how to throw down. So where do people go in Norman and Austin? Well, Norman, uh, Tara Humara's, uh, Baker Mayfield's favorite restaurant. It's interesting because you walk in and it's just like your typical Mexican restaurant. It doesn't seem any different than anything else you've seen before. I can't explain why it's so much better. It just is. one. Also, one quirk. So Norman is essentially, if you've never been there, it is essentially an exurb of Oklahoma city. It's it, it, mm -hmm. at this point, Oklahoma city has grown so much. It's basically a suburb. One weird regional quirk about Oklahoma city is queso is free at all the Mexican restaurants. The only place in the country where it's like that. Winner. I like that. And Tara Humara yeah. says great queso. So that one neighborhood jam for breakfast in, in Norman or OKC, uh, that it's like a little mini chain that started out there. It's awesome. Breakfast brunch place. Um, Austin is there's so many good places it's it's hard so I'll just stick to the barbecue obviously Franklin barbecue is the famous one I will suggest if you're with a group order in advance uh, you have to order at least five pounds if you got more than three people that's fine order five pounds go pick it up don't wait four hours in line but you could also go to La Barbecue 
which is phenomenal. Leroy and Lewis, which does a little bit different stuff than the typical Texas Trinity. They do, I think they do the Trinity, the the brisket ribs and and sausage on Saturdays, but they do like during the week all kinds of like they'll do beef cheek one day and they'll do a, a whole you know like I'll have a lamb thing or they'll do like a, a brisket smash burger, really good stuff. Um, and then also Terry Black's. So you cannot go wrong getting barbecue in Austin. Yeah. I will say having been to both cities multiple times, there's definitely more options for the folks out there in, uh, in Austin, but you, you nailed some good ones in Norman as well. Andy, uh, outstanding stuff. Plug, uh, plug your new venue once again, please. Yep. On three. So the show is called Andy Staples on three. Uh, we are on the On3 YouTube channel every weekday, 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern time. And also, show gets uploaded to every every podcast platform right after that. So if you're an Apple podcast, Spotify, Amazon, Music, whatever whatever you listen to podcasts on, we're, we're on that. It's just Andy Staples On3 and hit subscribe. Fantastic. I enjoyed our shows together back in the day on Sirius XM. And uh, as I've said for many years, I think you're one of the best to, to do it in this space. And we always appreciate you taking out the time. We'll uh, talk to you down the road before too long. My pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you so much. You got Thanks, it. Thanks, Andy. Andy Staples, one of the best.